we have incredible evidence on the benefits of walking. A large epidemiological study that looked at um, all-cause mortality and steps to make a correlation between them. Moving from 4,000 steps to 8,000 steps a day was associated with a 51% a reduction in all-cause mortality. When you move that up to 12,000, from 8,000 to 12,000, that was a 65% reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, so the, the other way that you can look at it is on the studies of being sedentary. And if you moved, uh, so if you moved from the top quadrant to the next quadrant down, and so the, the people in the, the top quadrant for just being sedentary, you could think of them as like getting almost you know, no movement. The bottom quadrant was going to be the most movement. But moving from that top quadrant to the next quadrant down was associated with a 49% reduction in risk. And that is just like doing any movement. So I think that we can see it in the walking data. I think that we can see the inverse in the sedentary data. And then we do have you know, all of the results from these subsistence populations and the blue zones where people you know, predominantly do walking. Um, the Hadza are really interesting to me because uh, as the women age in that society, they don't see a lot of you know, muscle loss. Their walking speed doesn't go down. Um, their bone density stays healthy. And uh, this is, I think they're getting, the Hadza women are getting, I think between 12 and 14,000 steps per day. Um, but they're also doing a lot of gardening. They dig for tubers. So they're just kind of moving all the time. Uh, they're, not, they're not doing strict resistance training, but they can still, you know, avoid, you know, a lot of uh, bone loss just from all of this low-level movement. Um, that being said, you know, I, I still think resistance training is incredibly important, um, you know, especially for women as, as we age. Well said. You know, you talked about lipid clearance and you kind of a little bit touched on that, but fat oxidation. Can you just explain that a little bit to our audience and its connection to walking? When we're doing kind of low level exercise, we're going to burn a little bit more fat and we're oxidized a little bit more fat than we are uh, glucose. As that intensity um, increases, you're going to start burning more glucose than you are uh, fat. And this is just fat in, you know, in our, in our bloodstream. Um, it's not usually uh, the, you know, the, the fat that's um, like subcutaneous or anything. Um, but I think that that can be uh, incredibly important. So, you know, if you go all the way on the other end um, to something really intense, like high intensity interval training, uh, you're going to be you know, burning almost all, you know, glucose on that side. So what can be great, you know, about walking is, uh, is the fact that you're, you know, oxidizing mostly, mostly fat. And another thing about zone two is um, that I know that Peter really advocates for, I'm a really big fan too, um, but in that zone two um, is going to be where you're going to be burning, you know, a little bit more fat than your glucose. So, you know, folks are listening today and they're saying, great, another thing that I'm adding on my list and that I'm trying to figure out how to get in. And you've tackled this pretty head on. And you have a few, you had a, a, a pretty um, viral tweet that was talking about how regular movement, even a few minutes squeezed in every hour or 90 minutes adds up when we're super consistent about that. Can you, can you walk us through that approach? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it can be very difficult to get, you know, even 10,000 steps can seem like a really big challenge um, moving from 4,000 to 10,000. Uh, but I think it's, a lot more manageable if you just think about like how to break it up. And so in that post that you were referring to, I was kind of going through the math of what it would be like if you just tried to move for five minutes every hour or 10 minutes every hour. And if you make the conscious effort of even just you know, walking for five minutes per waking hour, that would be 8,000 steps, you know, on top of the other steps that you're taking through the day. So that would probably put most people at around 10 to 12,000, just by moving five minutes of every hour. Um, if you move up to 10, that's, uh, you know, I think that was uh, 12,000 steps or, or thereabouts. So it can be difficult to think about, you know, moving, uh, taking a two hour walk per day. I don't think really anyone has, you know, much time for that. But, you know, that's not 
typically what we see in the subsistence populations, you know, they're not going out for a two hour intentional walk. It's very much broken up through the day and just kind of constant movement. Uh, so uh, a couple of things that I've done uh, in my life that have really helped is I have a standing desk. That's where I am now. I've got uh, a walking pad underneath. And uh, so when I'm working or, you know, in meetings, um, I'll just turn that on. Uh, that has made a really big difference. I also have a walking pad uh, in my living room. Um, so, you know, for watching a movie or anything like that, uh, I'll, I'll be on there sometimes. Um, but it's just kind of incredible, you know, if you just make some small changes in your habits, uh, the results can be pretty big. Like if you just commit to taking a 10 to 15 minute walk after meals, um, maybe a 20 minute walk uh, when you get up, a 20 minute walk before you go to bed. And that's going to put you right, right in the range of where you need to be. So yeah, I think uh, looking at it as this big number can be very intimidating. But with some very small changes in your habits, it can be manageable, I think, for most people. Any do's and don'ts for the walking pad? You know, I've gone through a few. Some I've liked, some I've thought, oh, this is a little <laughs> too bulky. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, brand that's out there uh, for walking pads? <laughs> I think it was called Sparax. It was, you know, kind of one of these off brands off of Amazon that I've yeah. been buying. I really like that. But I, I do think it's important to look for one that's going to have um, enough stride length for you. Uh, because if it's if it's too short for you, you, you might feel like you're going to fall off all the time. Um, so I think that's pretty important. And they're, you know, they're relatively inexpensive. I think you can sometimes find them on sale for around $100. And then um, another thing would just be, it can be a lot easier to store it if you're able to move it. And so finding one that's going to be light, light enough for you to tip on its side by your desk or something like that. Yeah, they've definitely gotten less bulkier and more inexpensive, which I really appreciate. I got one for my wife and I realized a few years ago, this was during COVID, it was very difficult for her to walk while she was doing work. Like she, she mm -hmm. hadn't, you know, some people like it. Some people have a harder time doing it. So I thought, okay, let's get a, let's get a walking pad that we keep in our living room at least that maybe if we're watching something, but it was so bulky that it was hard for her to move or reposition that she just wasn't using it as much. And I wasn't using it as much uh, because I do like it in different areas. So then finally she ended up getting one that was super, a lot thinner. Again, no affiliation. Uh, I don't even know what the brand name is. And that made a huge difference that you can kind of move it a little bit here and there, uh, unless if you already mm -hmm. have, you know, two, one in your office and, and one in your living room. So walking pads definitely can be a, a game changer. You know, talking, talking about tweets, you shared this uh, tweet from a gentleman named Victor showing an extreme version oh. of how somebody could log, I think it was 223 miles in a month, which is on par of somebody who is training for a marathon by simply, you know, massively increasing their their steps. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, I was really fascinated. I'm, I'm a big fan of this guy named Victor. He's a he's a bodybuilder. But what I love about him is how disciplined he is and everything that he does is just so inspiring. Um, but one thing that he does is he gets about 15,000 steps uh, every day, uh, day in and day out. And he shared uh, his walking stats for the year. And it, he was just like a machine, 15,000 steps every day. I'd also seen um, the mileage that was logged um, by a runner on X and uh, how much mileage he was doing. And I was noticing that they were, they were identical. And so he was in, in the mode of preparing for a marathon. And so his mileage was probably a little higher than it would have been otherwise. But it was just incredible to me that you could log, you know, roughly the same mileage um, as somebody training for a marathon. Uh, just by walking that much every day. And it's it's not exactly the same because there are going to be some different adaptations. You know, he's he's probably running six-minute miles at, at least, the marathon um, runner. He's a very, very good runner. Uh, so that's going to result in some slightly different adaptations than just walking alone. Um, the two parts of it are going to be um, what's called central. And so this is going to be, you know, changes to the amount of 
uh, blood that you can p- pump through your heart, um, things like that. You could think of it as like more of the power adaptations. So running will absolutely result in more of those. But there also, um, there's the other side, which is uh, more peripheral adaptations. And so this is where you get um, what's called PGC-1 activation. So this, one of the things that it controls is uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. And so it's going to tell your body to build more mitochondria. Um, it's going to uh, increase nitric oxide in your blood vessels, which is going to make them and your arteries a little bit more supple. And so all those peripheral changes, uh, those are what you're getting in walking. And I suspect that those peripheral changes are probably a little bit more important um, to longevity than the central changes. Um, and that's just looking at you know, what we're seeing in these subsistence populations where they have these supple arteries that are the same as ultramarathon runners, um, where they have very low incidence rates of chronic disease. So, you know, Victor in his 15,000 steps per day, he was getting, you know, almost all peripheral changes. And, you know, I would, I would love to see that guy's blood work because I bet it's absolutely fantastic. Picking off of that, one of the things that got you, quote unquote, in trouble <laughs> with some of the marathon runners that are out there is that you were making the argument that look at all this mileage you're racking up, as you mentioned, if you're walking you know, consistently getting in 10, 12, 15,000 steps every single day. And then look at some of this data that's coming out of these subsistence populations that are there. And the argument that I think that got you in trouble uh, with some of these communities and earned you an interesting title, which we'll talk about in a second, is that you were saying that you can develop elite level VO2 max, which is one measure of how well, you know, our longevity is heading if it's high or if it's really low, it's a it's a greater predictor of uh, um, of mortality from the literature that's out there. And your argument was you can develop an elite level VO two max simply by being super consistent with high volume walking. Uh, is that right? And then tell us what happened after that. Yeah, I, I think what really got me in trouble was using um, the word elite, and uh, uh, because I think elite to uh, that th- that group that was crit- that was uh, being critical of what I said fairly um, was that, you know, they're coming from a training standpoint. And so when they're thinking about an elite VO2 max, they're thinking about somebody, you know, who has uh, a VO2 max in the seventies, you know, so very, very, very high. Which would be just for context for our audience. If they're not familiar, that'd be like Olympic level, right? Yes. Olympic level. Think about it like a Olympic cross country skier or something like that. So when they heard elite, they were, that's what they were thinking. Like, you know, Olympic level VO2 max. Uh, where I was coming from was, you know, elite from a longevity perspective. There is um, a pretty big drop off in terms of uh, longevity benefits at some point in time. So if you move uh, to the top quartile, that's basically associated with about 97% of uh, the explanation in mortality. Um, moving, I think, to that top 2%, only got you one absolute percentage point more. Getting it much higher doesn't seem to you know, have too much benefit. So that's where I was coming from, from Elite uh, VO2 Max. I probably should have, uh, you know, retrospect uh, specified that. I think it would have avoided a lot of the arguments, but it did, you know, uh, result in a, a great new title for me. So I have that going for me. <laughs> yeah, and that title, for those who are following along, uh, that title is Walking Grifter. And that also, uh, I think you embrace this, which I love. I love that you don't take yourself too seriously on that side. You engage in the dialogue. It's called you a walking grifter. If those don't know, if if you're listening and you're like, what is a grifter? You know, it's somebody trying to sell something or marketing something or sign you up for something. So so the joke is that you're trying to sign up all these affiliates because you're convincing everybody to walk more. And then you said uh, people even accused you of being part of uh, big walking that you're being big sponsored walking, by Big yes. Walking, which I love that. <laughs> Those are all great things. We should totally get you uh, the domain name Big Walking and you know get some get some merch out there so you can actually- Oh, that's uh, a great know, idea. Have some stuff out there. <laughs> uh, you know, f- it's a funny story, and uh, but, the, but the beauty that came out of that, and I think the central message that's there for, for people is that there's gonna be a lot of things in your life, at least from the literature that, that, that's out there, if, if you significantly can increase your walking, and then especially as you age, 
you know, I have some people that are part of my core demographic and my audience that are, you know, listening to this episode and they're, you know, in their 60s, they're in their 70s, and they're thinking about things that they can regularly do for their health. And they might not have the level of um, agility or movement or uh, other aspects uh, that they might have had previously in their 40s and 50s. So knowing that there's still so much value that can come from doubling down on your walking is an important reminder for people who feel like, man, I, I, I can't do sprints yet. I, I'm not doing as res- as much resistance training volume. I want to get there. You know, what are the other things that I can do that can still take me in the right direction as I as I continue to improve my health? So I think that's an important reminder for people, and obviously one of those central reasons that I wanted to have you back on the that, that I want to have you on the podcast. Um, I want to go into uh, uh, something that you mentioned earlier, which was the vascular stiffening. Uh, are you familiar with uh, what are the best measures that we have available to us today? If somebody wanted to get a snapshot of where their, uh, you know, where they stood in terms of their vascular stiffening, um, what's available for them today that you know of uh, that's that's out there? Or what are the best proxies to get a sense of where your vascular stiffening is if you wanted to measure it? YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, Keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. You know, populations like the Amish in the United States, they are walking, you know, 18,000 steps. They have a lot less incidence of heart disease, hypertension, and then a lot fewer incidence rates of type 2 diabetes. 